Pentecost Baptist Church. Thanks for being here tonight. Good looking group. Let's stand and sing. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. This afternoon and sweltered in the heat. I didn't. I finally got my swamp cooler fixed. <laughs> so it was nice in the house. Uh, just a few announcements before we sing our next song. Uh, if you were not here this morning as a father, there's a gift for you on the back table back there. It's hot sauce uh, for those hot dads. So grab that, take it home with you, and enjoy it. You can have mine. I didn't take any home with me. I don't know. Can't handle that stuff. So uh, enjoy that. Take it with you. Uh, the offering is put in the box back there tonight. We're not going to be taking up an offering, or you can give it online. Offering. Let's see. Teen camp, June the 28th through July the 2nd. And uh, pray that uh, all the funds come in for the teens to be able to go. Pray that they'll go and have a good time. Pray for the speaker that uh, God will use him to speak to hearts. And uh, that souls be saved, lives be changed. Uh, I'm like pastor. Teen camp was good for me. Yeah, I made a lot of decisions there. So just remember to pray about that. Patriot Sunday coming up on July the 4th. And we'll have worship service that morning at 1045, followed by an afternoon fellowship with lots of good food. All right? And uh, hopefully a little bit of fun. Yeah. Amen. It's always fun to have a fellowship and visit. So. And then VBS is coming up. Mystery Island, July the 12th through the 14th and July 19th through the 21st. First 
there we go. Uh, sign up today. Sign up out there in the hallway, or you can sign up online. Also, the River Baptism Service is coming up July the 21st, 25th, and they need to know you want to be baptized so they can plan be prepared. You need to hope there's enough water. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anybody been by Lake McPhee lately? I can remember back when they started filling it, Brother Steve, and it's just about there about what it looked like and it's kind of scary in a way so pray God sends rain that'll be great let's stand if you would page 124 if you would like look to the screens God will take care of you be seated. Welcome back tonight, and I'm excited to jump into the scriptures together this evening. Thank you, Brother Wilson, with your help in uh, uh, getting us to this point. Thank you to our musicians for being a blessing tonight, and a couple things I want to update you guys on before we jump into the scriptures together this evening. Uh, First off, um, we have had several, several um, of our dear people who have recently passed on uh, to heaven. And uh, it's kind of uh, sad in, in one sense, because uh, these are friends. Uh, those of us that have been here for a while um, understand uh, many of these people that have passed on are really pillars of our church in years gone by. And uh, we appreciate their faith, their example. Um, but we want to honor them, too, and encourage the families. Uh, so this Friday, uh, uh, June 25th at 2 p.m., is when we're going to have the uh, celebration of life service for Miss Pat Sykes, and of course uh, uh, their kids, Greg um, and Jeff, will be here as well. Um, and just be here if you can. It's on a Friday at two. Uh, they wanted to do Saturday, but I have a wedding on Saturday, so there's a conflict there. And so getting here Friday at two uh, might be a little hard for some of you. Um, but uh, I, I dare say, if you knew the Sykes, uh, it's worth the effort to be here. Um, and Miss Pat especially. One of the things I was talking to Dave about Pat, and one of the things about Pat that is just, and this was so true, 
um, even though she was she was all um, bent out of shape with uh, with her uh, uh, with her condition. What was it called? Um, osteoporosis. Um, and even though uh, that was a hindrance for her for many years, as long as I knew her, that was um, that was something that she had to struggle with. Yet she was probably uh, one of the most friendly people in our church. Um, and uh, Dave said she, they'd come home from church and she'd say, did you know this was going on? Did you know this goes on and on? Did you meet this person? Because she was just always so friendly. And they would always ask her, how in the world did you find that out? And she said, I went and talked to him. <laughs> and it's an amazing thing what a little friendliness can do. Uh, but it's because she genuinely loved people. She cared for people. She would call the ladies of our church. And uh, they would call her, uh, especially ones like Daisy May um, and others that just check in on them, make sure they're okay. Uh, a great a great lady, a great testimony there. And so we'll honor her this Friday at 2 p.m. And then a week from this Saturday on July the 3rd, um, we are going to um, be uh, honoring Miss Norma Coppinger and having a service for her at 10 a.m. Now, um, if you can be there to be a blessing, I know it would be an encouragement to Tara, to Tamis, uh, to Lou and Ginger Sapp, uh, to that family. Um, and, you know, Norma... Um, was another one. She was a lot more quiet, a lot more behind the scenes, but she had a very sweet spirit and a sweet heart for the Lord. And uh, we'll be taking time to honor her on that day. And so I hope that you'll write that down and plan to be there. Pray for me because I'll be getting back from teen camp on July 2nd, late that evening, and then have the funeral the next morning. And so um, we'll, uh, um, we'll get some rest eventually after teen camp. Maybe this will be the first time in... Uh, uh, 15 years of doing teen camp that'll actually get rest at teen camp. What do you guys think? No, no. I don't think so. I don't think so. But uh, we're going to have a good time with it. And honestly, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and uh, uh, so those are some things. And then, um, of course, Tom Butler passed away uh, late last night, as we mentioned this morning. So pray for um, Shirley. Uh, pray for the family. All three of his daughters are in town. They're not Shirley's daughters, um, but they were his daughters. And uh, just pray for peace in the family there, and uh, just pray for Shirley. Uh, she's hurting right now. Um, I got to talk to her a little bit this last week, and uh, just she said some things that um, I, I just know she needs encouragement. I'll just put it that way. I just know she needs some encouragement. It's a tough thing losing someone you love, and uh, of course we have another widow in our church now that we need to look out for and take care of as a church. Um, and so. Uh, even those of you that don't know Shirley well, she needs some good Christian sisters right now um, in particular. And it would be great for you to reach out to her and try to encourage her. It really would. She needs it. And I'll just, I'll just put it that way. As a pastor, I know that she needs it. And I would encourage any of you that the Lord would put that on your heart. I'll put you in contact with her. I'll bring you over there and introduce you to her. But she needs some Christian sisters right now to gather around her and try to encourage her in the Lord. And so keep those things in mind. Uh, here this evening. All right, well, we're going to jump into the scriptures together tonight. And uh, as we get ready to do so, I want you to take your Bibles and go to Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be all over our Bibles tonight. Um, and in this study, we believe um, we're going to continue on with this study here tonight. And uh, I should have done this last week. I did not, but I made some slides this week to uh, maybe help us along. I did it for the teenagers. And uh, I'm going to do it for for you grown-up teenagers too, okay? And uh, maybe uh, stimulate some more thought in your minds, giving you some visuals here. Uh, but we believe, last, last week we looked at what we believe about the Bible itself. And as we continue tonight in this summer series, um, we are in this series wading through the, the depths of the doctrine uh, of what we believe as the church. And in this study we're looking at what the Bible teaches about what we should believe. Doctrine is a word that means teachings, and what we're looking at is the teachings of the Scripture. Listen, there are a lot of creeds that um, organizations have made teaching their people what they should believe. Now, I'm not opposed to having a creed if the, the, the text for the creed comes from what this Bible actually says. So, I'm not against creeds. We have a statement of faith, a statement of faith for our church. It's in our uh, bylaws and constitution. And that would be a creed of sorts. Um, uh, the, the reformers made uh, some of the, the creeds that a lot of people refer to today, uh, still to this day. 
There's nothing wrong with those. We don't get our doctrine, we don't get our faith from creeds of men. We get our doctrine and our faith from what the Word of God teaches. And, um, and I think it's important that we understand the difference there and that we're able to understand what we believe from the Bible itself. And so that's why we're focusing on this throughout this summer series here. And, you know, as I said last week, for young believers, uh, this is a study that will help you become grounded in your faith. And for mature believers, this is a study that I hope will be something that will help you be able to defend your faith and increase your faith. Um, and if someone were to ask you why you believe what you believe, that it would, it would equip you with some scripture uh, to be able to defend your faith and explain your faith biblically. Um, you ought not say if someone asks you, why do you believe that? That's what the church, that's what the church teaches. Wrong. <laughs> understand that's what the Mormons say too. understand that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. That's what my church teaches. Who cares what the church teaches? If the church isn't teaching the Bible, it's wrong. We ought to be able to say this is what the Bible teaches. And that's, this is the backbone of our faith. And by the way, as Baptists, um, our first principle that we hold to as Baptists is that the Bible is our sole authority for our faith and practice. What we believe and what we do should come from this book. And uh, that's so important. So as we continue this series, I, I think it's appropriate here on Father's Day that we'll be taking time to study what the Bible has to teach us about God as our Father. And uh, this study, properly called... Um, for students of the Bible is called theology. Um, theos, God, um, ology, the study of, the study of God. And so we're going to be looking at this together uh, here this evening. And uh, a study on the subject of, of God is a pretty vast subject. <laughs> we're talking about an eternal, infinite God. And how in the world could we possibly cover everything there is to cover? The truth is we can't. Uh, Job put it well, I believe, in Job chapter 11 and verse 7. Um, and actually it was Zophar who was speaking these words to Job. And he said, can you by searching find out God? Can, can you find out the Almighty unto perfection? Listen, there's no way that any of us would ever be able to really understand or wrap our minds around our God. If he was a God we could understand, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? And he's not a God that we can wrap our minds around. And so uh, a study on God is, is really too vast for us to ever cover. Even if we uh, took the rest of our days on this earth to study the subject of God, we would never be able to uh, uh, really scratch the surface of what there is to discover about our great God. Now, there are some misconceptions in the world today regarding God. And I want us to think about this before we dive into the scripture here some people base their belief about God on their existence um, uh, or on their feelings, or I should say on their experience or on their feelings. Um, what some people believe about God, uh, they get from what they feel should be true about God. Or they get from, well, you know, if, if God would allow me to go through some of the things that I've gone through, then I just can't believe there would ever be a God. Have you ever heard someone say something like that? Their experience dictates what they believe about God, or their feelings dictate what they believe about God. Other people base their belief about God on their religion or their tradition. Well, I was always taught that God was, and that's what they base their belief about God on. In other words, it's not a personal relationship. It is something they were told they were supposed to believe about God. And that's a lot of people. It may be some of you to some extent um, about what you believe about God. And that's what some people do. Um, and, but the Bible should be the only foundation that we base our belief about God upon. Uh, what God's word has to say about God himself uh, should be the, the foundation for what we truly do believe uh, about God as our father. And so Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, if you're there, say amen. amen. Now here we find in this text when, when Moses was asked to describe who God is, that is when God told him to tell the people of Israel this. And, and God said unto Moses, and read that phrase out loud with me, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. God is the self-proclaimed one. That's what the I am here in the scripture is telling us. He is the self-proclaimed one 
And that what that means is that he alone gets to define himself. You don't get to define God. You don't get to put God in a box and make God to be what you want God to be. But that's what we do as humanity. We want to make our own gods. Uh, from the beginning of time, this has been a fault of humanity. We want to make God into an idol of wood or, or stone or metal. And we want to put God in a box and make God out to be something, someone who, who lives to serve us and to fit our needs and to do what we want him to do. But that's not who God is. We serve God. God does not serve us. We live for God's glory. God doesn't live to lift us up. God doesn't live to give us glory. And we, we're often so selfish when it comes to our viewpoints about God. And so God is the self-proclaimed one. And he has chosen to proclaim himself to us through his word. I like what the Bible tells us there in verse 14 of Exodus 3. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say. What was, it? What was he saying? I want you to tell Israel my word. I want, you I want you to define me to my people with my own words. Thus shalt thou say unto Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And so God gets to define himself for us here today. And the place where he has defined himself to us is in the scriptures. And so as we begin to look at the, uh, 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 the, the, this teaching, what the Bible has to teach us about God, we're going to look at four different areas here tonight with the time that we have. And I want you to notice the first one here that we're going to look at, and that is the existence of God. Let's look at this first, the existence of God. Take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. Understand this, God in the scripture never sets out to prove that he exists. It is just assumed to be so. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, some of you can quote it with me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There was God. Listen, there's no question about God. In the scripture, God is just assumed to always have been. God exists. And, and this matter that the scripture assumes to be true is something that the world has continually called into question. When we think about the, our, our current day culture especially, we've got all types of ways people uh, say they believe about God or don't believe about God. The atheist says there is no God. The agnostic says that the existence of God cannot be known. Well, there is a God, but if there is a God, we would never know it for sure. That's what an agnostic says. All right? The pantheist says that God is the universe and the universe is God. And uh, pantheistic ideology is being taught in a lot of uh, children's, uh, children's things that are being put out in this day and time. You've got to be careful about that. The humanist says that man is his own God. And I would say that humanism is probably the religion that is the most on the rise in our day and time. Now, they would not call it a religion. But any time man makes himself out to be his own God, then it is a religion. He's worshiping himself. And so there's all types of ways, and there's a lot more than what I've just mentioned to you. And what I want to get across to you this, this evening is that uh, the, the world is fine with you believing in no God. It's fine with you believing in many gods. Just as long as you don't try to assert that there is one true God. Just as long as you don't try to assert that there's one true God and all the other gods are false. You can believe as many gods as you want, as many religions as you want, but to believe in the one true God, that's a problem in today's current culture. And this world is set against disproving the existence of God or minimizing the existence of God. Well, maybe there is a God, but we won't know exactly who he is. You ever heard someone say, well, all religions basically lead to the same place? All gods are basically the same God. We just, we just see God in different ways. No, no. That's a bunch of hogwash is what that is. The Bible gets to define for us who God is. And I said this this morning. In spite of what society says, Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You are a fool to not believe what the Bible has to tell us about God. And so as we look, look at the existence of God, a couple of things in our world today um, reiterate to us the fact that God exists. Let me give these to you. First off, science reveals there is a God. 
Science reveals there is a God. Now, so many people in this world say it's science itself that disproves there are God. I believe the Bible teaches us and science itself teaches us that there has to be a God. And I want us to consider this together. Go to Psalm chapter 19 and verse 1. One of the greatest evidences of God, one of the greatest evidences of a creator God is his creation. Psalm chapter 19 and verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. And the fact is, when you look up into the stars at night, when you look at this great and vast creation that God has made, it is one of the greatest evidences of the fact that there has to be a God. Even Charles Darwin, the father of evolutionary theory, he once admitted this towards the end of his life. And I want to read this quote, and listen to me. This is Charles Darwin. He said, the impossibility of conceiving within our conscious selves that this grand universe arose through chance seems to me the chief argument for the existence of God. And Charles Darwin himself said, when I look at how vast this universe is, how intricate this creation is, that's probably one of the greatest arguments that exists in the world that there has to be a God. Even the father of evolutionary theory himself couldn't deny the fact that creation points to the fact that there must be be a creator. The Bible goes so far as to tell us that the testimony of God's creation leaves all mankind without excuse to the fact that he exists. Romans chapter 1, if you want to go over there, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. By the way, if you can't keep up with all these references, I encourage you just to write them down. These are things you can go back to and look at later. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says this, for the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse. Listen, what the Bible's telling us there is that the the, the fact that God exists, the invisible things of God from the creation of the world have been clearly seen. You look around this world and the invisible fingerprint of God is all over everything that exists in this world. It's obvious that this world was created by a creator. I don't care if someone chooses to believe that there is no God or not. They can't deny the fact in their heart that compels them to believe there has to be a God. And creation, science itself, is one of the proofs, one of the evidences that reveals there is a God. Here's the second thing I'd say, not only science, morality. Morality reveals there is a God. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 2. You're in Romans 1, uh, one chapter over, Romans chapter number 2. Now understand this, God created this world with certain laws that cannot be broken. And the fact that there, is a, the, the fact that there are um, certain uh, principles in this world that exist that universally we believe as humanity are right and universally we believe are wrong. The fact that there is a divine uh, a moral law points to the fact that there had to be at some point a moral lawgiver who gave us an understanding of right and wrong. And this is what's taught here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible tells us here that these laws from God have been ingrained in our hearts, on our consciences. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature, this is verse 14, the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now some would call what the Bible is speaking about here as our conscience. And uh, uh, Jiminy Cricket, he kind of got, got us off base uh, with teaching us when we were, well, at least when I was a kid, okay, uh, let your conscience be your guide. Oh, that's not a good thing because we've got messed up consciences. And yet the fact is, he did teach us one thing. Our conscience is that part that exists inside of us that God has created us with. It's your God-given ability to discern things that are right and things that are wrong. We understand as fallen humanity, our consciences can be defiled even be seared. That's why you have people killing their children through abortion and not feeling like there's anything wrong with it. Okay, they have have seared consciences. 
that there's a serious flaw in their hearts. And yet God has ingrained some things in all of us, um, laws that he's written on our hearts and helped us understand that there are some things in this world that are right and there's some things in this world that are wrong. In other words, in other word, words, God made the world with a moral law. You go to any place in this world and to some degree they believe it's wrong to kill somebody that's from their own nation. I believe it's wrong to be with another man's wife, wrong to steal things. There's some basic principles that are universal throughout all the societies of men. These are things that God has written upon our conscience. And uh, this moral law, the Bible says here in, our, in, in Romans chapter 2, has been written on our hearts. And that fact is evidence of the fact uh, of the God who put it there. And so understand this. The fact that there is a moral law necessitates a moral law giver, and it's another proof of the existence of God. And so God exists. We believe in the existence of God. Science reveals this to be true. Morality reveals this to be true. But I'd also say this most predominantly, and there are many other evidences that we could give, History reveals this to be true. Logic reveals this to be true. I could go on and on and on with this. But most predominantly, we believe that God exists because Scripture reveals this to be true. Because the Bible tells us that it is so. And uh, though proof exists that there is a God, and boy, we could give compelling arguments, and some um, uh, Bible scholars and apologists dedicate their whole lives to go into secular universities and try to convince the minds and hearts of, of, of lost young people um, and, and professors about the reality of God and the existence of God. And I'm for those people. I'm not against those people. But though there is proof that God exists all ingrained all throughout this world, none of these evidences will ever be enough to call someone to believe in God. In other words, you're never going to have a compelling enough argument from the perspective of science on its own or from the perspective of logic on its own to convince someone that God exists. And, and uh, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11 because I want, to sh I want you to see this from what the Bible tells us. Because here in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible makes clear that believing in God is not a matter of fact. It's a matter of faith. I said this morning... You want to be the type of person God chooses, you have to be foolish enough to believe God. The world says it's foolish to believe the gospel. And you know, uh, they're always, that, that, that's, that's always been true throughout the ages of, of history. But in order to truly believe God, it's going to, it's going to take a decision of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith believes things that cannot be proven. Um, and the Bible tells us here that it's the substance of things that we hope for. And uh, the, then it goes on in verse number 6 and it says this, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that what? You've got to believe that he is, that he exists, in other words, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, ultimately, Scripture reveals to us the fact that there is a God, and we are compelled, based on the, what the Scripture reveals to us, to either believe in God or to not believe in God, but we cannot leave with any other perspective. But ultimately, the greatest way that God has revealed himself to us is through his Son. I want you to flip back to the beginning of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. Because God made himself known to us in a personal way when he came as a man and revealed himself to us as Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. All right, all two of you, fantastic. All right, God, who at sundry times... And in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by who? His Son. God made himself known to us through Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And the, and the only way you can truly come to know God 
and believe in God fully is through faith in Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about it. And so we believe in the existence of God. Now, on a Sunday night at Lighthouse Baptist Church, I don't think anybody walked in tonight not believing in God, okay? Why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because there's a lot of people outside these four walls that don't believe in God. And you need to be able to tell them from the Scripture why there is a God. And the Bible gives us ample evidence to be able to uh, 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 approve the existence of God and help people come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so understand why we're doing this tonight. So we believe in the existence of God. The second thing I want to look at tonight is that we believe in the essence of God. We believe in the essence of God. Now, essence speaks of that which makes something what it is, the essential nature of something. It's the uh, intricate fundamental nature of a thing. It's the essential being of a thing. And when we talk about the essence of God, we're talking about the essential nature of God. What makes God what God is? Isn't that a hard concept to wrap your mind around? The vastness of God makes a study of his essence really an impossibility. Uh, In one passage of Scripture, God even says, Do I not fill all time and space? Well, boy, how in the world are we ever going to comprehend that? Have you ever tried to comprehend the universe? Does it ever end? If it does end, where does it end? Is it in a box? What's outside the box? I, I, I can't wrap my mind around the universe, and yet the Bible says that God fills all time and space. And that's a part of his essential nature. And that's what we're looking at here when we talk about the essence of God. And so a couple things here about the essence of God. First thing I want you to write down here, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 in your Bibles here tonight. Now you've got to come with your thinking caps on on Sunday night. Some of you better take a longer nap on Sunday afternoon. You're ready for this, okay? And uh, John chapter number 4. And verse number 24, we'll see what the Bible says here. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the fact that we say God is a spirit, for some of you it might conjure up in your mind an image of a ghost um, or uh, some other type of apparition. All right, when you talk about a spirit being, um, that's what a lot of people think of, but that's not at all what we're talking about when we talk about the fact that God is a spirit. Um, I like what one person said about this. When, the, when, when Jesus says God is spirit, he simply teaches what the Father is like. He's divine, not limited by matter, time, or space. He's eternal. He's incomprehensible. He fills all time and space. He's everywhere at the same time. Uh, Just as much as he's right here in this room with us here today, he exists on the other side of the world and in heaven and in the the heavens above us in, in the universe in time and space in every period of time. God is there right now. From the beginning of creation to the end of the world, God is already dwelling there right now. Now, I can't understand that. I can't wrap my mind about that, about, that, about that fact, but the fact God is spirit means that he's not limited like you and I are. Now, each one of us have a spirit, but our spirits are confined right now to our temporal bodies. One day when we die, to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord, our spirits will go be reunited with the Lord, but God's spirit is so much unlike our spirit because God's spirit dwells in all time and space and matter. He's everywhere. That's where God is, and he is a spirit being, Um, and that's important for us to understand. It's a part of who his essential nature is. No, God is spirit. The Bible teaches that we will see him one day in glory. That's hard for me to understand, all right, but I think it helps us understand something about the spirit nature of God. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said he saw the Lord high and lifted up, okay, okay, on the, um, uh, at the uh, uh, Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they saw the glory of Jesus Christ as he pulled back the veil of his flesh and revealed his glory to them. 
They, be, they began to see a part of the essential nature of God. Moses saw a part of the essential uh, 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 nature of who God is in the book of Exodus. And, of course, we go to the book of Revelation, and we see John describing what Jesus Christ appeared like when he looked upon him. And so what we understand is that though God is a spirit being, yet we shall see him as he is, First John chapter 3 tells us, in all of his glory. And uh, listen... If that's hard to understand, that's just how it is. It's God, okay? Um, I, I like to say, well, I, I, can define, I can define for you in specific terms what God looks like and, and, and how God... Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, and this is a story, so let me explain it briefly. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the land. Ananias had promised to give a piece of land to the work of the Lord, and he'd held it back. He'd not given it. And Peter confronted him and said, Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost and not given what you said you would give? In verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? And read the last phrase out loud with me. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, a minute ago, he said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. In the verse 4, he comes back and says, you've not lied to men, you've lied to who? God. Guess who the Holy Spirit is? He's God. He's God. Now, we understand this, but hey, it's a whole lot better for us to know that the Bible teaches this to be so. Because listen, this was something that in the, in the, really in the, in the 19th century was greatly under the bait. Uh, there, were, there were many... Um, uh, 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 liberal um, uh, theologians who were debating the fact that whether, uh, of whether the Holy Spirit really was a part of God. And you think, why in the world would that be so? Well, it's not something that we struggle with today because our forefathers have fought some serious battles and studied their Bibles and taught the church what the Bible has to teach about the uh, uh, Trinity and about the, the Godhead of the Holy Spirit. And so we believe in the Trinity. Know how important that is for us to understand uh, this fact right here. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. As you write that down, maybe even turn there. 1 John 5 and verse 7. Probably, probably one of the greatest verses on this subject in all the Bible. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. The Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are what? They're one. Now, it's inter I find this to be interesting in a lot of new versions of the Bible, and some of you might have a newer, newer version of the Bible here tonight. They take this verse out. Um, or they only put a portion of the verse, verse in there that, that attacks the Trinity, um, the, the, the Trinity of, uh, of God. And so be careful about that. I would not use a Bible that is trying to attack the essential nature of God. Um, and there are ramifications for that when it comes to prophecy as well um, that I don't have time to get into here tonight. Uh, so be careful of that right there. But the, the truth of the Trinity is something that's taught all throughout the Bible, and uh, we're running out of time here tonight, but let me just give you these verses. You can go back and look at yourself later. Genesis 126, the Lord said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, why is he referring to himself in the plural? Because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, um, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. God refers himself, first to himself in a singular term, the Lord, Jehovah. Um, and then it refers himself, to himself in a plural sense, our God, Elohim. Well, how could, it be a, how could he be a singular God and a plural God at the same time? Because he's a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 6, 4 teaches us that. And many other passages we, we could go to there, but understand the essence of God. We've seen the existence of God. We've seen the essence of God. A third truth I want us to look at tonight are the elements of God. The elements of God. Now, in his book, um, Living Purely in, a, in an Impure World, a book written by Jim Benny, he addresses, and he is a Christian counselor, and who's written this book, and he addresses what he calls the number one issue that he faces in all of his counseling. And I want, to, I want to read to you what he said here. He states very plainly, the number one problem I encounter in moral struggles today 
is a poor image of God. People don't understand who God is. They have a low or a poor image of who God is. And I believe that this is a problem in Christianity today. We have a problem with really understanding who God is and allowing the reality of who God is to impact our lives on a day-to-day basis. And God has a lot of things to tell us in his word about who he really is. And when we talk about the elements of God here tonight, what we are talking about is his attributes or his characteristics, the, the, the things that compose who he is. Now, there are attributes that God has that, he is, that we can be like him in. The fruit of the Spirit is, for example, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. These are, these are uh, fruits of uh, having Christ in our heart that we can uh, demonstrate in our own lives. But really, when we're, talking about the, uh, uh, um, when we're talking about the elements of God, the characteristics of God, what we're really talking about um, are, are things that we cannot be like God in, characteristics of God that, uh, that we are not necessarily like him uh, in at all. And this is what I want to focus on uh, for just a couple of minutes here tonight. I don't have a, a, a time to dive deep into all of these things. Uh, I'm going to uh, teach you some of uh, these things, give you some definitions, and hopefully you'll go back and look at some of these things for yourself. But let's look at some of these um, ele- uh, elements of God. First off, if you're taking notes, write this one down. God is eternal. God is eternal. Psalm chapter 90 and verse number 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God is eternal. He had no beginning. He'll never have an end. He's existed before time existed, and he's existing right now in all frames of time. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around the concept of eternity. I don't have time to illustrate it tonight. But understand that our God is an eternal God. All right? Number two, not only is God eternal, but God is holy. He is holy. Some people would call God's holiness his defining attribute. It's important you understand what holiness is, especially when we talk about the holiness of God. Psalm chapter 99 and verse 9 The Bible says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. We talk about God's holiness. What does that mean? Let me give you a proper definition. The fact that God is holy means that he is set apart from all all creation and exalted above them in infinite majesty. He is set apart from all creation and exalted above them in infinite majesty. One of the greatest demonstrations of holiness, practically speaking, in the Bible is the fact that every time someone stands in the presence of God, what do they do? They fall on their face. You guys know I don't like that song. I can only imagine because I think it's actually anti-scriptural. What am I going to do when I stand before God? Am I going to dance before him? Am I going to sing before him? Am I going to shout before him? What am I going to do? I'll tell you what every person in the Bible did when they they stood in the presence of God. They fell on their face. Sorry, if you really like that song, I'm really sorry, okay? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Why? Because he's holy. He's not like your favorite celebrity. Oh, am I going to run up to him? And He's holy. He's exalted above you and I in infinite majesty. We'll never be like him in all of his infinite majesty and glory. He's God. He's sinless. He's perfect. Um, For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, separated of sin, and exalted above us. That's what the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews. We studied that, and that's what the Bible teaches us about God's essential nature of Holiness, and so understand our God is holy. Revelation 4, 8, the four beasts had each one of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. God is holy. 
Here's a third thing I want you to write down. God is immutable. Well, that's a big word. Hey, Siri, how do you spell immutable? All right, you can do that later. God is immutable. What that means is this. You could write this down instead if you'd like. It means that God is changeless. He cannot change. He does not change. We talk about the immutability of God. That's what we're talking about. Psalm 102, verse 26. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Of course, we know Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is immutable. This world changes. The culture of this world changes. The philosophy of this world changes. But there's one thing in this world that will never change, and that's God. That's God. And uh, that's important for us to understand that there. Here's a fourth thing you can write down. God is infinite. God is infinite. That means he does not have limitations in time, space, matter, or energy. He is not limited, limited by the confines of time. He is not limited by the elements of the world. I just don't know how God could work this situation out. Are you serious? God is infinite. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Is anything too hard for God? Is what the, uh, what the Lord asked of Abraham in the book of Genesis. Gen uh, Psalm chapter, 50, chapter 90 and verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the uh, earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, uh, thou art God. Psalm 147 and verse 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God is infinite. He, he is more infinite than what any of us could possibly ever comprehend. Here's a fifth truth I'd say about God. God is life. He is the source of all life. He is the giver of life. He's the one whom life comes from. He created life in the beginning. He's the sustainer of life to this day. Um, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. Uh, uh, John chapter 5 and verse 26. Some verses you can write down about this. For as the Father hath life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And uh, so many verses uh, communicating the truth that God is life. Um, a sixth thing about the uh, elements of God is that God is love. God is love. He, uh, uh, um, it is the fact that God is love. It's this factor that moves him to communicate himself to us in this world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right. Um, of course, First John four sixteen, and we have known and believed that God, uh, the love that God has to us, God is love, and He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in Him. The only way you and I can ever know how to truly love is through God. God is the source of love. What the Bible teaches us is that we do not produce love; we reciprocate love. In other words, I can only ever love you as much as I understand that God has loved me. And uh, that's an important truth that's taught in Scripture. Now, we can, we can give to each other things that uh, seem to give the appearance of love, but true love is only possible in connection with the relationship with the one who is love himself, and that is God. And so God is love. Boy, there are so many of these, and but I, I want to give you these, these ones here because these ones are important. Um, number seven here, God is omnipotent, omnipotent, okay? If you want to, me to help you spell it, uh, omnipotent. Well, that's a big word that you should be familiar with, but it's a word that means uh, that he is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. He is limited by his nature and can do everything in harmony to his perfections. That's my favorite definition of omnipotence. He's limited by his nature and can do everything in harmony to his perfections. Uh, I used to work at, um, I'd go to uh, uh, the Indiana State Fair and I'd work at a station uh, from, for the Good News Mission. And we had a little uh, display on the table. It said three things God can't do. 
Well, that, that really makes people interested. That really, that really make, makes people interested. And um, we'd have that there, and then they'd come over, and they had to flip the, flip the things over. And um, one of them was God can't change, okay? The uh, second one is God can't sin. And we gave scripture for that. And the third one, I, it was shorter than this, but the third one was something along the lines of God cannot let anyone go to heaven who has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then we'd give the gospel to them. Um, and it just got people thinking about the gospel. That's what I'm talking about when God is limited to his nature. There are certain things that God has said he won't do. And he won't change. He won't sin. And uh, the, 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 that, that's, that's what I mean. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying when I say God is limited by his nature. God can do anything that God wants to do. Um, but God can't sin. God can't change. Um, he is, but he is all-powerful. Uh, I wouldn't call the things that God can't do um, things that uh, uh, are very difficult to do, okay? Um, things that God ever intended anyone in the world or universe to do. Um, and so understand that clarification. Jeremiah 32 and verse 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Luke 1, 37, For with God nothing shall be impossible. God is omnipotent. Number eight, God is omnipresent. That means that he is everywhere at the same time. That's what that means. He's present everywhere at the same time. And listen, he's not just present everywhere at the same time in this exact moment of time. He's omnipresent everywhere in all periods of time. Now wrap your mind around that. I can't understand that. That that connects with the eternal part of his nature. But he's omnipresent. Some scripture here, Psalm 139, verse 7 through 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God is omnipresent. Here's, a, here's, here's the last one I'll give uh, on this point here, and that is that God is omniscient. He's omniscient. Now, the omniscience of God speaks to the fact that he knows it all. He can see it all, okay? Um, and again, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 make this clear to us. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word of my tongue, but, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot a- a- attain unto it. First John chapter 3 and verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. God is all-knowing. He knows it all. He, he is everywhere at the same time. He's all-powerful. This speaks of the uh, characteristics of our God. And I don't have time to elaborate these, but let me just give these to you um, so we can move on. Uh, God is perfection. He makes no mistakes. Okay, Psalm 1830. God is personality. Uh, he, has, uh, uh, he, he knows. He feels. He has a will. Um, he's created us to be like him in that way, but God is a personality. Um, and that's a part of, of the characteristics that define who he is. He can be grieved. He cares. He has personality. Um, the Bible teaches us this. God is self-existent. He didn't have a creator, okay? Uh, he's the self-existent one. That's what I am comes from that we talked about earlier. That's a part of who he is. Um, and then God is truth. Um, He identifies things as they are. I like that definition of God. He is truth. Whenever he says it, it's just so. He's truth. He identifies things as they are. We like to say truth is relative. God says it's absolute. And he says it's absolutely whatever I say it is. Okay? Now, we do that sometimes with our kids, right? Um, Why is that true? Because I said so. 
Now, it's not true when we say that necessarily to our kids, but when God says it, it is true, okay? Because God is truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. And uh, so understand that element, that aspect of God there. And then, uh, and then another uh, element, characteristic of God is that he is sovereign. He is the ruler over all. God is orchestrating all the circumstances of this world together according to his sovereign will. The Bible says, uh, uh, well, let me just give you these references. Psalm 103, 19, Isaiah 46, 10, 1 Timothy 6, 15. Talk about the sovereignty of God and how he rules over all the things in this world. Proverbs 21, verse 1 is another good one. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever he will. Listen, men can be elected into positions of authority and act like they rule in this world, but God's always the one who's really in charge. And he can even take the evil intentions of man and turn turn it around for his good, glorious purposes. That's the sovereignty of God. And that's something that we've been focusing on with our theme uh, this year for quite a while. Now, I don't have time to jump into what I wanted to jump into with this final thing here, and so I'm just going to have to mention it to you. And I'm bummed because there's a lot more good stuff we could talk about here tonight. But the last thing I wanted to look at here uh, are the exertions of God, the actions of God. We've looked at the fact that God exists. We looked at his essential nature. We've looked at his uh, elements, his, his attributes or his characteristics. But there's another aspect of God that really you should study out for yourself. And that is what God does. We worship God for for really for three primary reasons. We worship God because he is God, okay? Because he exists and he is the one true God. We worship God because of who he is. Many of the songs of worship that we worship God for are for some of the things we just talked about. His perfection, um, his faithfulness, uh, the fact that he is always there for us. We worship God for who he is but we also worship God for a third thing. And the third thing we worship God for is because of what he's done. And when we talk about the exertions of God, his actions, how he works in this world, that's what we're talking about, the things that God does. What does God do? Well, God creates. Um, Genesis 1.1, Hebrews 11, and verse number three, God created the whole world and the universe, okay? Okay. Uh, What else does God do? God preserves. Um, We talked last week about how he preserves his word. The Bible also teaches us that he preserves his saints. And by the way, I'm glad when it comes to the context of my salvation, it's not up to me to keep my salvation, but it's up to him to keep his word about my salvation. He preserves. That's something that he does for his people. And I thank God for that truth right there. Um, Another action of God in this world is his providence. Um, We talk about God's providence. We've talked a lot about providence this year in our study of but God. But when we talk about the providence of God, we're talking about his watch care. We're talking about his foresight. We're talking about the fact that he knows what's going on and he knows what we need before we even know that we need it. And he orchestrates our path to make sure that we have what we need. That's God's providence. He puts us where he knows we need to be, even if it doesn't make sense to us. He crosses our path with the things that our path needs to be crossed with to fulfill his purposes in our life. That's the providence of God. Genesis 50, 20, um, our theme verse this year. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 8 are good verses about God's providence. And uh, boy, I, the, the list could go on and on and on here tonight uh, about what God does in this world. And the fact is, I could give you everything that's on my list and I haven't even scratched the surface. But my hope with this study is that it will whet your appetite for wanting to dig deeper into the word. Listen, what would be really good instead of trying to take all of this and get it all is to take one thing that God spoke to your heart about and study it and learn more about God in that one area. I think... As a church, we should be familiar with a lot of these things. We should understand God's essence. We should understand that God exists and be able to defend that from the scripture. We should be able to understand some basic things about God because that exalts our worship of God when we see how great and how grand God is. When it comes to your heart right here tonight, 
What's something about God that God spoke to you about that you didn't really understand before? Perhaps as we've studied this tonight, there is something that God did in your heart to provoke some, some thought or some questions that you need to dig deeper in. I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, that's partly what our small group follow-up is all about, is encouraging you to dig deeper in your understanding of who God is. And uh, that's very important. And listen, one of the greatest things that ought to happen from a study of God is not to fill your head with a bunch of knowledge, okay? That's going to do nothing good for you just to be able to say, well, I know what what immutability means now. Well, do you want a cookie? I mean, what? It's not going to do anything good for you to know what immutability means if it doesn't exalt your heart to worship the Lord. Really, a study of God, a study of God should bring you to a point of worship. Have you ever tried to just take time not to, when you pray, not, not to ask God for things, but just take time to worship God? So often our prayers are so vain and so empty. Uh, Lord, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for being, and we usually all of us have one aspect of God that's our go-to, <laughs> okay? We always thank God for being something, and I don't belittle that. But when you really take time to think about who God is, to think about what God has done for you, it enhances your ability to worship the Lord. I'm telling you, that's one of the reasons it's important that you study these things. I have a list of these things in my devotional journal, and oftentimes I'll go through them and I'll just look at that list, and on any given particular morning, I might pick out an attribute of God I haven't thought about for a while, or, or a work of God that I haven't thought about for a while. God, thank you. Thank you for your election. Thank you for your choosing. Um, Like we talked about this morning, uh, someone who's weak like me, someone who's a fool like me, someone who's base like me, thank you for that. It enhances your worship of the Lord. And if there's anything I can do to compel you, I think that that should be our primary motive for a study of God so that we can have a deeper relationship with him. He is our Lord. He is the one that we're supposed to be closest to in this world. And yet so often, he's the one that we know the least about. And today, the application and invitation for you is to deepen your relationship with the Lord by learning more about who he really is. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As we take some time for invitation here tonight, when's the last time you really worship God because he is? God, I'm so glad that you exist and that you have made yourself known in my life. When's the last time you worship God because of who he is? Because he is present there for you. Because he is a sovereign God. When's the last time you've worshipped him because of who he is? When's the last time you've worshipped him because of what he has done in your life? God, thank you for meeting my need. God, thank you for watching over me, for being a providential God. I didn't even know I needed the things that you put me through to happen in my life, but God, I thank you for your providence. When's the last time you worshipped him because of who you have found him to be? That's what I want you to think about during this invitation. And perhaps we could take some time as a church to worship God tonight. And I hope that you'll go from this place and study more about the things that we've looked at tonight. But most of all, these things have got to lead us to a place of worship. That's what I want us to focus on during this invitation. And so as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many of you would say, Pastor, there's something about God that God spoke to my heart about tonight. I want you to pray for me. God spoke to my heart tonight. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I see your hands. This is your opportunity during this invitation. So right now, let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed as the music begins to play. God spoke into your heart. Let's take a moment to worship him, church. Let's take a moment to worship him for who he is, for what he's done. This is your invitation. You can kneel in your seat. You can come forward to an altar. As God's speaking to your heart, you do what God is leading you to do.
good evening tonight, uh, studying the Word together, and appreciate your faithfulness being here this evening. Um, and I, I, I am looking forward to this study. This study has greatly helped me, and I appreciate you being here for it. I know it's in depth, and uh, um, I had one preacher when I preach messages like this. Uh, a retired pastor, he told me, he said, I like drinking a cold cup of water, but I don't necessarily want to drink it out of a fire hydrant. <laughs> um, sometimes when I preach messages like this, uh, I feel like I'm trying to give it to you from a fire hydrant. But um, it is so important that we understand these truths. And I, I know that we're not going to get everything. You're not, every one of you are not going to get everything of what I'm communicating from the Scripture tonight. But perhaps a few things you can write down and study deeper from the scriptures for yourself. Uh, if the only things you learn about God are from the word of God come from this pulpit, there's a problem in your spiritual life. You need to take it home. You need to dig into it for yourself. And I hope that you'll do that. A couple of announcements. Uh, grab some of the VBS flyers on your way out. Hand them out to your neighbor kids, your grandkids. Um, any kid that you see, um, invite them to come to our VBS. Um, and uh, so uh, take advantage of those. We'll keep printing them as, as much, as the, uh, much of them as we need. And then one thing I failed to mention this morning is this Thursday from 11 o'clock to 2 p.m., um, the uh, Patriot group in town is going to be honoring all of our first responders. Now, they have asked me to come say something in honor of our first responders and pray at the beginning of that ceremony at 11 o'clock. Um, we are planning to do something for our first responders later, closer to 9-11 this year, but I don't think we can do enough uh, to show our appreciation. And so they have asked if any of you would be willing to help with maybe baking some cookies and providing cookies. Uh, they're going to be feeding a luncheon uh, to all the first responders from 11 to 2. And so if you'd be interested in helping with that and coming to that, if you want to come out to support our first responders, uh, the ceremony is going to be taking place at 11. Um, the luncheon is not for us, okay? So don't come to eat their food, okay? It's for the first responders. Um, we're coming to support them. Um, Butch and Pat Smith um, are helping to organize this. They go to our church over here this morning. Um, if you want to find out if you can do more to help, they would be the people to contact, and I'd be glad to give you their phone numbers. Um, but I promised I would mention that. I neglected to do so this morning. And so I'm doing it tonight. And thank you for being faithful here tonight. We do have one more thing we need to do because we have a birthday this Thursday. And it's for our very own Don Wilson. We have a, we have a cake. We have a cake tonight for Brother Wilson. And it's his birthday cake. Uh, one of our teen girls made uh, for him. He's graciously sharing it with us, mostly because he said, there's no way I need to eat all of this by myself. And uh, so if you want to stick around for some fellowship, that'll be great. 60. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. All right, let's sing happy birthday to Brother Wilson, and then we'll pray and be dismissed for a time of fellowship. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Be dismissed, and we'll have a time of fellowship uh, in Brother Wilson's honor here tonight. Brother Ken, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the sovereign God that you are, Lord, and, uh, and for just the simple fact that um, you are a God of grace, a God of love, of mercy, and uh, forgiveness, Lord. And um, we just uh, thank you for learning, allowing us to learn, Lord, uh, your attributes, uh, the different uh, character traits that you have, Lord, and uh, Lord, we are undeserving of your word, of the preservation of your word, but we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the freedoms that we have here in this nation and that we enjoy. And, uh, Lord, we ask God that you just bring peace and, and um, the strength to uh, Shirley Butler, Lord, as she uh, uh, is in this time of need. And, uh, Lord, we think of uh, Bill Gap and, and many others uh, that are in a similar situation, Lord. I just pray that um, you would bless them, Lord, as, as you see fit and that... Um, you would bless this uh, time as we celebrate uh, Don Wilson's uh, birthday, Lord. We ask that you would just bless the food and nourish it to our body. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.